Hello everybody and welcome to the final Architects Bookshop isolation talk. Uh, you might be able to hear in the background, my office is back and running. We've got about 50% of our people back in the office, which is good. It's nice to have people here, nice to see what's going on in the world and have people back in our lives. Um, so we're about 50-50 running between and we thought that it was now as people are getting back into their lives and enjoying their lives and uh, back to the routine it's probably the right top it's time to stop the isolation talks um we did have a couple of questions this week about why we were doing them and i think for us one of the most important things about doing these talks is uh in, in times like this when uh, there are significant trauma going on in the world uh you know government is responsible for keeping everyone safe and dealing with the economy but we collectively are responsible for the culture so from our point of view the opportunity of trying to help build maintain nurture the culture is a super important thing within the architectural community so that's really why we've done it and to that end i just wanted to thank um jenna who helped help organize it at the start and to my husband mike who's been really uh, pivotal in making sure this can happen. Um, he's also been running the bookshop in the last couple of weeks online and all of you who have received um, books delivered head by hand, all you Sydney people, um, that's husband Mike, he's come delivered to them. So thank you to husband Mike for doing that. <laughs> but as <laughs> our last um, isolation talk for the series, um, we may have Michael and Alana from Friedman White. Hello, Michael and Alana. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> You're on <Hello>. now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How are things? Good. Good. Thanks for having us. Oh, pleasure. How's Don't Melbourne? being the last chilly. Freezing. Yeah, Melbourne's freezing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, well, it's nice to have you here. It's nice to, um, I've been watching your work for ages and I think that of the practices in Melbourne, you're doing sensational things. Uh, I know we were talking early, um, talking earlier before and we got every before we jumped on and um i know you started i started the firm in 2013 which makes you ridiculously disgustingly young um and i know that the first project you're going to talk about is one of the first projects you ever did um so look without further ado we're super excited to have you uh, super excited to finish off the series with you um so yeah pretty much over to you guys thanks adam thanks adam Great to be part of this, and um, yes, yeah, so I'm Michael, and this is Alana. Uh, we're we're Friedman White. We're a husband and wife team. Um, we met at RMIT some years ago now, and as Adam said, we started the practice in 2013. Off the back of this project, it was our first project, and it was a private job. Um, we were both working full time. Um, when this one was started and, and finished, and um, it was it was off this, we thought it was about time we should um, have a go and, and start our own practice. Um, we have three great support staff: Jan, Juliet, and Natasha, um, all working from home at the moment. Um, so we we sort of treated this presentation as a bit of a, a review of the work we've done and where we started and, and where we're heading next. Um, so we're bookending the pres with uh, one of our la latest and largest projects. Um, this one, North Melbourne Townhouses, is a collection of four townhouses and it's a pretty ambitious project in what we were trying to achieve on a, a small inner city and field site in North Melbourne. Um, we actually live in one of the end townhouses still um, with two children now, um, sort of feeling a bit like we're bursting at the seams, but um, it's been good um, living there and it's been a good kind of um, test to see, you know, what we could change um, if we had it all again in front of us and sort of learning and to live within one of our own designs is really sobering and, and a great way to kind of see how we can learn from those lessons and, and um, improve them on the next projects. And our office is around the corner, just a few metres away um, in, in Queensbury Street, North Melbourne. So here you see the sort of the main elevation to the, to the laneway interface. Um, it's a mixed use site and we were really trying to promote flexible type of use on ground. We, at that time, this project, we had a strong interest in multiple residential 
projects and how um, they can, kind of, as architects, how can we contribute to um, more appropriate designs of apartment living or townhouse and um, the typologies that fall within multiple dwellings. And we we really engaged with the kind of ground floor here as this um, mixed use program. We were running our office rooms just the two of us out of the ground, a bit out of the first floor, living above. And it's been interesting to see how neighbours, the other three down the other end, um, have been using their ground floor for various uses. Um, sometimes see a car in there, sometimes at the end one there was a band room for a bit, um, secondary living space. And ours at the moment is a rumpus for the kids to um, spill all their toys out onto. Michael, did you know this you were is, going to live here when you designed it? We did, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I failed to mention, we were, we were um, the, the sort of, the idea was, it was sort of, you know, 50-50 at the time, but we were, it was more a concern about can we afford this um, sort of straight out of uni and thought, well, we'll give it a go. And we sort of started to tinker and tailor things a bit um, with the developer. Um, and as we kind of went from DD to, to, to contract doc and we were pretty committed at that point. So um, that's when we had to make a decision where we're going to commit to some of the um, differences. And so we I love this project. It's such, it's one of my favourite Melbourne projects. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. The mixed use um, quality of it. Yeah, thanks. It, it's, it was um, it was a challenge because in the mixed use even extended up to the first floor where um, we, like I said, we were sort of poor uni students at the time, then starting as new grads, and and then found a way to offset the mortgage. We got some a couple of um, some friends to live in this first floor. We had a little kitchen, the kitchenette in there and it became a, this, this sort of um, self-contained unit and we lived upstairs in the in a sort of a one bed with a, a void, um, so to speak, and working a bit out of the ground floor. Um, this is the next level up, the main living space and you can see how kind of spatially constrained it is. We included a double height void over the dining space so where we were limited horizontally spatially we sort of made up for it with this um, double height void so vertical dimension was exploited and the main bedroom in the mezzanine above and an ensuite looks onto that void and a little slot void as well that looks into the balconies below and there's some rooftop amenity as well um, and this you know, it's the elevation of that photo I sent before and we we had some tricky interfaces of other you know, cheek by jail apartments opposite and terrace homes and mixed use um, topology so we sort of looked to have more of the solidity at the top levels um, and focus the views internally to those balconies below and and having more of a transparent base for um, some of those mixed use opportunities on ground this is the west and east elevation the west was deliberately sort of blanked with the brickwork um, to preclude the solar heat gain and the east was a bit more open. Sectionally, you start to see some of those voids um, over the living spaces take play. And here from one of the en suites, you see, you know, you're looking internally onto the other brick wall of the neighbouring townhouse and you can look down over the slot void. And here from our bathroom is more of a city view um, looking out through the east there. Um, so um, this sort of highlights the fact that the main aspect of the site is south facing so we like to include skylights as a way of introducing a delicate diffuse light which we often prioritize in our work over more direct light this is a double height um, void space that Michael was referring to with the living below and you can see that the views are layered across the volume and make the spaces feel larger than it is. Um, this, each townhouse footprint is only 47 square metres. So we're really trying to enhance that sense of um, openness and, and space. Again, this is looking from the bedroom into the ensuite with the void below. Here we're standing in the living space looking up towards the bedroom area with a double height void above. And those screens can slide off to give a bit of privacy, not great acoustically, but you know, blocks out the light to the bedroom above. And there's about three panels on one side and four panels on the other. And then you have the interplay of the sheer curtains as well, softening the, the walls. 
Um, here we're looking up at the ceiling over the void. You can see the interaction of additional skylights with the dappled light and the void peels off where it becomes a slender void with the, between the double height and the glazing to the ensuite above. Here we're standing between the terrace and the living area, so internal and external sequence. And standing in, again in the living area, which is a bit more compressed and then looking towards the double height space. Again, the living area, which has got the lower height ceiling, more contained. From the ensuite, looking back across to the bedroom, and you can see the sheer curtains tempering the light. And back across to the void there, um, seeing how that void um, slices off to the, uh, to the ensuite there. And so we start to really experiment here with the kind of sliding panels which you'll see in the, the later larger projects and sort of cutting our teeth on this first project and, and seeing where it can go. Um, the, that first floor uh, is now the kids' bedrooms, um, a couple of bedrooms and a bathroom which is, is this level where we had our friends um, renting from us. You know, it was previously as well without that wall in between the two bedrooms, the extension to our little studio space so we've included that wall now for the kids. And off the back of those North Melbourne Town. Yeah. Can I just ask, with, the, with that previous project, was it at all influenced by um, Kirsten Thompson's project in Fitzroy? Yeah, without a doubt. So, you know, go, going through uni with Kirsten Thompson's reference projects and, you know, real love to that. Um, and, and the kind of the idea about having a flexible framework and good bones behind um, multiple residential projects was definitely um, and it, uh, you know some design cues taken from those they're similar such, projects. They're both such fantastic projects. I mean, honestly, I think they're the two best mixed-use kind of low-scale, multi-resi, flexible buildings in Melbourne. They're just absolutely sensational. Just well done on those. Um, it's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. So, so Marcello. Donati, um, the instigator of Whitlam Place, who was a good friend of ours from uni. I met him the first day and, um, you know, sort of got on really well from then on. We never really worked on a professional capacity, just um, kind of larrikin students. And he, he came through, I think we were doing defects um, on the North Melbourne townhouses and came through and he was talking about this amazing project in Fitzroy that he'd started to sketch up um, various plans for. and why wouldn't we jump in an opportunity to collaborate with him on that? And he sort of, you know, was at the time, um, his family ran a butcher, but the his fine meats in Carlton, it's great, highly recommended. Um, he was looking for some registered architects and um, how we might, you know, collaborate on this. There was no formal agreement drawn up in any way. It was, it was really a second C approach. And there was thankfully great synergy with Marcello and, um, we really enjoyed working with him on the project. The, the site was a an old um, had a old tilt up factory, single story tilt up factory on it, and it had been in the Donati family for thirty years. And the development model was to internalise the profit by retaining the top two apartments. Um, and this stems from a desire to contribute to the community and hold the profit within the building rather than taking it out. And this resulted um, in an intensely tailored design approach of eleven of the apartments um, were really planned from the inside out and working closely with the end users and purchasers. Uh, and the built form reads as one unified mass, really more like one um, divided into one palazzo divided into 11 homes. And it's located for those aren't, who aren't in Melbourne, a uh, suburb of Fitzroy on the edge of the CBD. Stones throw from Brunswick Street and sits adjacent to a small pocket park um, by the same name in place. And across the road is the Fitzroy Town Hall and of course central Melbourne pub we've all been to, um, the Napier Hotel. And, and these were the existing conditions that really held the, the park. Um, we contained it nicely. The existing factory wall held within the park space, however, really lacked a human connection and activation to the public park's edge. Um, there were three enormous um, 
iron bark gum trees that sat adjacent to the existing um, factory, as you can see in this photo. We saw this as an opportunity to engage directly between the park and the new building. The park was underutilised and we thought maybe this was due to, in part at, due to the lack of passive surveillance from the existing factory. The existing conditions photo um, is of the approach to the park from the north of Napier Street and one of the key discussion points with council through the planning process was maintaining the view lines and a sense of scale to the town hall. The forecourt and the portico of the town hall already established this proportion of a, of a street wall that we then followed. It's inspired by the classical proportions of the Fitzroy Town Hall. Whitland Place offers a dynamic interpretation of its fluted Corinthian columns, arched windows and rich architectural detailing. The weight and presence felt of the Town Hall columns is visceral and this we feel has been responded to with equal sense of permanence with our design response for the apartment project. This is the final built product with the town hall in the background. Um, the town hall's portico street wall um, is a design opportunity to engage with the street wall proportions. And so we aligned Whitland Place's parapet with that of the town hall. We've shown in this street elevation, the neighboring projects to the north, which maintain this strong datum height From the town hall side, the apartment building sits quietly within its context. Here, a photograph of the finished building screened by large iron bark gum trees on the shared boundary with Whitland Park. What we see as being successful with the project from an urban massing strategy is this direct engagement with the town hall. Uh, as a studio you know, design process, we work both through 3D modelling, but um, physical modelling as well is, is quite important and in those earlier kind of models, this one's a presentation model, but um, you know, the early kind of crude models that we started to stack um, this this heavier top on a lighter a podium field like transparency and balancing um, material weight against structural lightness. Finished image here to the park, you can see the weight of the Fluted, column, uh, fluted panels on top of those light field base and those precast arches um, are a repeated module. A copper oxide treatment to the concrete exterior was deliberately chosen to complement the metallic luster of the eucalyptus leaves and the rusty bronze of the iron bark trunks. This treatment creates depth and variation and dissolves some of the weight of the material. The way in which the project is grounded in its urban and park context is in part due to the framing and referencing through material finish selection. And there is a clear link to the Town Hall Corinthian fluted columns where the precast wall construction is also articulated in a fluted pattern. And that's been painted in this liquidised copper finish um, and also drawing a, a nice connection to the rusty red and green iron gum trees on that park edge. The natural staining through the resin of the leaves and the from the rain only enhance this coloration and allow the building to continually evolve and retain it through the course of time. This forms a dynamic backdrop to the neighbouring park uh, with many of the dwellings enjoying views into the silvery treetops. There is a bridging between this project and its great urban context through this way in these moments. The materials were chosen for their ability to retain over time and having selected for that purpose they make visual links to that civic quality of the and the noble materials of the town hall and St Mark's Church to the east of the site. All the terraces are focused, focused directly south from their apartments through the vale of the foliage into the Whitland Place Park, which offers a constantly shifting panorama of light and movement, dappled light through the leaves. Here's our more recently completed project next to Whitland Place, um, which we'll come back to, but just to show it there before and, and after completion. And it's a play between volume and light. Um, the variation longevity of those materials is, is really important. There's, these photos were taken quite initially uh, after completion and um, there's a real softening of the paint finish and the, the brass to the shrouds now. We 
work directly with the specialist trades, um, which is a real joy on this project, and it's something we try to do on the apartment projects as much as we can, um, like the house projects. And um, it was made much more easier through a great builder here with Visionaire Builders that um, really endorsed and, and helped us collaborate with their trades. We learned a lot of the traditional detailing techniques of those brass shrouds with um, Scott and his team. Looking rather fresh and blingy the the paint and the brass here, so it's really softened off a lot now. As with these copper, these gills here um, are for the mechanical ventilation from bathrooms and kitchens behind the wall. Um, that that copper's really softened off now as well. But looking for different ways. Um, to, to kind of articulate the, the details rather than just a, a louvered grill for the mechanical articulation. If I take you now down to the ground floor um, level and the, the lobby entry, you can see here that we've exposed the fire extinguishers, the gas and the water meters, and they've been set into the garden beds where we were hoping that the landscape would take over those services which they now have, which is great to see. The street level interface engages with the public-private dialogue in a more interactive and transparent manner with the introverted arch arches providing a more porous space. The park is now being utilised more than ever. The building activates the park's edge through the illumination and the passive surveillance of the apartments above the recessive concrete balconies, curtains, screens, and the veil of the foliage allow a sense of privacy for both the park users and the inhabitants, whilst allowing the sense of presence. As many of you know, it's, it's a difficult interface to design to for ground floor living, um, as commercial use wasn't a viable option for the client. So our design vision for the ground floor apartments was to have some setback of depth for a buffer where we could and elevate above the park's edge where the natural ground fell away. The inverted arch columns are a repeated precast module. We detailed a step at the top of the columns for the fluted concrete spandrels to rest on top of. You can see here the steel moulds made by Euro Precast for the fabrication of those concrete arches. There was only one mould that was used and this is the first concrete arch coming out of that mould. This is the arches in place before the fit out had begun, so the rawness. And again, just the raw concrete, both the fluted panels and the arches before the fit out had begun. And here we start to see some of the framing of those local markers, um, some marks there. And our projects try to be highly site responsive and not in a literal reactive approach or manner, but instead through spatial intelligence um, that employs question that what is the most appropriate dwelling topology or edge condition at the interface between the site at that point and the public realm beyond. So here to the park there was was calling for a kind of a, a recessed balcony with, with real sense of solidity at the boundary there in the public realm. The fluted panels were made um, in a very cost efficient way. It was through a method of rigging together this standard a PVC piping on a timber frame um, where for a job of this scale we we couldn't we couldn't use a rectally mold rubber mold where the cost was prohibitive and we, we were wanting quite a bit of depth to the facade so working with George and his team at Bureau Precast um, to find a way it was through these 100 diameter PVC pipes and then working with him to get the spacing just right between each pipe so that the external corners of the building came to this mitre junction. The panels being erected. So back at the ground floor interface, you can see the garden beds here. It's actually Marcello's mother who tends to the garden and seasonally plants the flowers. 
the children who attend the local primary school then pick the flowers on their way to and from school. Andy Fergus wrote in an article recently, community over commodity. Even though it's a commercial development, that is a, a strong, there is a strong drive from the client to deliver a project that chooses community over commodity. The intensely tailored design approach is apparent as soon as you step foot inside the entry lobby with custom pink and green marble terrazzo flooring and neon lined circulation spaces. As Mike mentioned already, there, we used a lot of specialist trays on the project um, with Virginia. There was um, Bruno, the grumpy Italian tiler, who screeded, poured and polished the cuts, custom terrazzo that were laid with remnant tile offcuts. Martello was incredibly hands-on with this process and helped break up the slabs of marble and lay them um, individually on the floor with Bruno. The neon light fittings were made by Stephen Cole, whose services are typically engaged by artists and commercial ne neon signs. We documented the ground floor um, fluted panels out of to be made out of precast the same as the external facade. However, these internal components were all part of the finishing trade scope and therefore um, there was a late change to make them out of glass fibre reinforced concrete, which was fine. The common areas have selected artworks that were chosen specifically. The back of house spaces were given equal attention to that of the lobby space where we've used this pink persimmon paint and um, across the stair and the handrail. The paint's insignificant in cost, however, it has a high impact. These colourful flourishes and moments of whimsy to otherwise typical droll and monochromatic utilitarian spaces. The line markings in the car park are also out of this same paint. Just a detail of that handrail. So we'll walk through the a few of the um, apartments of the building, starting with Betsy and Malcolm's. Um, they own two apartments, one at ground floor on the southeast side of the building. It's a small flexible apartment and then they own the two better up on the second level. So walking through that ground floor space first, um, it's, a, it's a difficult interface there on the, um, on the corner. So Betsy thought it would be a good opportunity to have uh, her offices in there um, running a small um, counselling rooms from there and and you can see here from the main entry it's a it's a small space but we started to customize certain elements to it, the components with joinery and doors that allowed for more of a flexible use of the space there's 3.2 meter ceiling heights allowing for better adaptability of the use uh, rather than lower ceilings and um, Betsy, you know, living upstairs, um, it's a great opportunity to have this on ground floor and in, in close proximity to leave your home and go straight down to, to the work um, where she works. It's also a great place for their adult children to come and stay when visiting from overseas and the odd Airbnb, Airbnb opportunity as well. These the unveil of the, the steel mesh curtains here and the balcony are um, really, really good because they're quite transparent when you look from inside to out, but opaque when you look from out to in. So they can be drawn and closed off. So we'll now go up to level two to their, their apartment and it's a two bedrooms in the U formation hugging the living space. Um, when planning the internal layouts of the apartments, there was real priority given to these um, central apartments first because of their south facing orientation. Um, so we, to maximise access to natural daylight, we've proportioned these middle apartments with a two to one width to depth ratio and bookending the corner apartments around um, and they have dual aspect across ventilation and they, they hug the, the middle of the apartment. This is Betsy, Malcolm and the, the dog Manny. Uh, and the, there's good thermal comfort delivered through the, the thermal mass properties of the concrete throughout and good access to natural light is 
the apartments are, are not deep, as I said, and solar panels and rainwater harvesting, as you'd expect in a contemporary apartment building. But for us, you know, Marcello Lana and I were really thinking about the longevity of the spaces and, and durability and, the, and their flexibility, you know. Uh, Betsy having that ground floor space um, to, to work from and having the opportunity to to age in place. And, and as architects, we personally see our contribution in apartment projects being the, the, the spatial intelligence that we can offer through the design, um, you know, and having good bones and a flexible framework of spaces that allows for changing lifestyle patterns to occur over time, rather than, you know, we'd hate for, to see the residents becoming spatially frustrated with, with a space and having to sell and move on because it, it didn't allow them to grow in, in the space. And so for this building, the, is the quality of the build and the, the, the rigorous detailing behind um, the componentry that allow for high levels of comfort and longevity with minimal day-to-day -day reliance on energy usage and waste that we thought was important. When it comes to interiors, um, particularly for this apartment, we we came from the, the approach or manager of a simple lux attitude that, um, you know, commercially constrained projects um, don't have endless amounts of budget for finishes, so we like to pair economical finishes with notes of or highlights of another finish, in this case brass and or, or marble, and, and feel that that elevates the space and invites a sense of occasion, so around a door. Um, thresholds or thresholds from common spaces to apartment entries, it's become a bit of an obsession of ours to think about the entry sequence as this connective tissue from front gate of the building of, or lobby to the front door and how there are markers along the way that, um, that heighten the kind of um, senses through, you can see here the entry to Betsy Malcolm's apartment, there was a bit of a detail for a reveal of marble around the door. Next, we'll walk you through a, a typical bookending apartment, um, the west and the east and ends of the building. Garan, Maya and their tenets, teenage son own a two-bedroom apartment that has an east and southerly aspect. Justin owns a two-bedroom apartment with south and west westerly aspects. A greater sense of depth in the facade is reinforced through deep reveal detailing and a bleeding of the copper oxide finish extending into the internal surfaces of the balcony spaces. The deep reveal to the trapezoid windows fully absorb observers' attention towards frame views of a distant marker that feels unmistakably like Fitzroy. We are also very interested in imbuing a sense of depth to the facade of our buildings. These thresholds to the apertures are equally as important as the thresholds within the internal experiences of the building. Here, the singular use of the oxidising copper paint finish on the exterior facade walls and interior surfaces of the balconies promotes a sense of bleeding of the colour and light that's felt from the ironbark gum trees adjacent. The wide glazed frontages with outlook to the tree-lined park is provided to all apartments. The iconic town hall in the distance, a constant reference point with its civic scale and sense of grandeur, imbued in the apartments in both volume, archetypal forms and detailing, which just helps integrate Whitlam into its context. On both the east and the western facades, apertures are deliber deliberately located to puncture the solid shell and to frame and enhance the surrounding context. These are often whimsical apertures, modulating in scale and bleed into the internal spaces, deliberately smaller ones separated from the cluster. The deep reveal trapezoid windows always drawing your attention towards a frame view. The bedrooms are deliberately modest in size and neatly tucked away. The living spaces are much larger and celebrated. The blocks of timber double as bed heads with open shelves, niches on the bedside and drawers to the robe on the other side. In these current times of work from home patterns and residents in our apartment projects choosing lifestyles of convenience, 
we see simple inclusions such as asymmetrical composition of thin steel floating shells, a delicate pendant and a robust bench top within a niche offers residents flexibility zones for welcome stations or audiovisual equipment or study spaces. So we'll now walk through the top two apartments at level three. This is Marcello's own two bed apartment, uh, which has south and eastern aspect. And his sister Olivia and brother in law Jack and, and niece Raffaella live in the one next door. So, firstly, Marcello's um, apartment shown to the right of this plan with a semicircular terrace punctuating the mainly rectangular shaped footprint. It's a two bedder, it's, it's a large two bedder. And you can see how large the living spaces are and bedrooms still kept quite modest in scale and, and, and matching the size of the apartments in the lower plates. This is the man, Marcello, who is, um, as I said before, studied architecture with him and uh, he's, he's now being a fine butcher at um, his dad's shop, but dabbling in, in great work as well. He's, he's still continuing his architecture passion. So from the front door, you start to get a glimpse through to uh, his apartment and his, his is the neon in, in red. The, the other apartments, you know, we, we sort of went between five or so different colours and, and started to give different colour neon um, signatures to each apartment entry. You glimpse through and then hit this view looking east. Um, it's this sort of striking, striking spatial energy um, of the oculus above and, and that curvature from the, the glazed um, balcony there. Almost a bit like a, a lo-fi James Terrell artwork, the, uh, the skylight starts to take on different shades from Aubergine to a, uh, an apricot and, you know, this image here was when we were doing defects and really took on quite a, a purple hue in the late uh, sunset. And, and working again on site with um, Visioneer to start to kind of tweak the, the tapering or the orientation of the, the, the upper skylight so that we could perfect what we'd sort of planned initially and it was, it was really great that we could do that with them. And then you start to allow that that light to um, to kind of highlight some of the finer ground details in the apartment as it, the light gets shot onto the, the curve glaze into the terrace softly guiding from the living zone on the west around to the, the eastern side to the, the the dining space feeling more cocooned and intimate in that corner of the apartment and using just one large sheer curtain um to, to to temper the light really you know it's south facing but there is still a bit of um direct western light in the, the summer months so we um Included this just to have a bit of softness and um, offer some tranquil repose up in the living spaces. With Italian design influence and sensibilities, it's sort of felt throughout this apartment through the pink and green terrazzo flooring with some playful scarpress detailing and much of this um, eclectic furniture. With windows of the world for the steel uh, curved windows. So, there's some images as the framing was going up and starting to work with them, looking at the set out of the, the, the curved track, real lightness to it felt there. And the stone uh, terrazzo half, almost an element of that ground floor lobby or the balcony of my child's fractured off um, to become a little stone half under the fireplace. more of the uh, the depth in those windows where they really scale up to to meet the proportion of Marcello's apartment here. The typical deep reveal window in those bookend apartment bedrooms where they can become little sitting nooks, the top pane of window dropping down to make it a balcony space, a Juliet balcony. And yeah, thinking of different ways rather than what 
you know, is this standard or expected of a walk-in robe to a, a main bedroom, thinking more about, you know, elemental elements becoming um, dividing pieces like this block of timber that becomes the bed head and drawers on the other side. The glimpses through the space of the overlapping and layering of those details is quite important and it is important to us on various projects so that when we're fighting constraints, you know, spatially when spaces are small, we look to extend the view. Here particularly these bathrooms are, are very small, only 1.4 and a half wide to 2.7 longs, but looking at how we can use that paint finish into the light port to extend the space and have floor to ceiling windows to make it feel larger. We laboured over details here with, with Marcello to use the singular use of the Elvis stone to be um, become the trough and the, the floor and the wall treatment as well. And so lastly, walking through Olivia Jack and Rafa's apartment on the west, another two bedroom apartment. They're expecting their second baby, but it's great to hear that they're gonna stay on. And, um, and I think the living space is ample um, in size and they'll work it out with that second bedroom as we all have to, if we're expecting a second. Um, <laughs> here they are, <laughs> bit contrived posing for a feature recently, but the difference, I think, you know, with my, to Marcello is it's a bit of a Jekyll Hyde um, the layout with the two apartments um, where it's is quite clearly more open and um, curvaceous with the, apart the, the the balcony kind of guiding you softly around those living spaces here. In Lib's apartment, there's more containment, more kind of tightly held space, which you really like that contrast between the two. So the entry sequence ends at you arrive and your view is towards the kind of 45 angle of that central balcony. The kitchen layer has been still really extended where it kind of pulls you through into the meals um, and kitchen space as it kind of bleeds into the circulation space. The overlapping views, you know, looking at the seminal up modernist works where you use those courtyards to add transparency, but they also are a great way to kind of filter view and, and start to have some of the greening of the courtyard um, layer up to to see a distant view beyond it becomes quite special I think dynamic you know that's complexity to the, the spatial relationships here feeling far more Fitzroy where you can see across to Afton Gardens and towers beyond. Back to the living space this view from the dining and a Palladiana terrazzo using Carrara marble chips, which was um, a great process really, working with Bruno again and his team and the sort of half cut through long planks of Carrara marble to then hit them off, um, strike them and they'll get the frayed edge and then have them beautifully laid out and, and uh, infilled with an epoxy with the harder, harder wearing and then Actually, I took that idea, it was brilliant really, to turn turn them into dining tables with Bruno for his sister and himself. I think this is the um, residential apartment building that every residential apartment architect wished they'd designed themselves. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's like, it's like achingly good. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's a great feeling up here in the trees. My favourite space is would be Garans though, down on level one. I think it's got a great connectivity to the streetscape and still feeling quite removed. Okay, so back to the park and. So, um, we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to design another apartment, oh, sorry, another residential building against a park. This time it was townhouse typology. This project has transformed into a larger apartment project as the client acquired the adjacent site. 
So it's now being redesigned by Breathe and Fieldwork. Um, but funnily enough, we are starting to work on a collaboration on a newer project on the other side of the park. So the existing condition was similar to that of Whitlam Place, where there's an existing warehouse, which the warehouse's wall lines the length of the site. In light of the previous discussions of Whitlam Place, its response to the urban context, this project seeks to draw on the lessons learned, in particular to the ground floor interface of the residences. So we were working with Open Work Landscape Studio. The design outcome at ground level is a shared dual key pedestrian and car court entry at the rear. The primary res residential entry is from the park. Um, this took some strong negotiations with the council to convince them to allow access off to the dwellings off the park. We were less successful with that argument on Whitland Place. Um, the council's main concern was the privatisation of the public space. Having learnt from Whitland Place and having more space here, we've introduced an adaptable space on ground that gets natural light from both the car court and the park. Like Whitland Place, this project begins with the idea of providing generosity in design and giving back to the public realm. Council had a strong desire for a clear delineation between public and private. So our team took the opportunity to articulate this boundary edge condition with low height garden walls that are deliberately scaled to the height of a bench seat. This is hoping to invite the residents to occupy the steps of the facade and engage with the park. Like many studios, there is a cross-pollination of ideas from one project to the next. This photograph of a recently completed townhouse project explores similar design ideas to the edge condition and the connectivity connective tissue of moments experienced through the entry sequence. And so there was this idea that we were trying to instill in Albert Street, the, the park project in Brunswick, that you, you would have these mo moments looking through those kind of upper levels down through to the park at varying heights and, and having the ability to always have that park as a constant reference and and it's something we were testing on this Richmond townhouse project. So this is the Albert Street project again. And at the upper levels, the height of the window sills and the depth of the reveals to these openings are controlled across the living and bedrooms. So the residents can always control their level of privacy and interaction with the park without loss of passive surveillance for the park users. In this 3D representation, you can appreciate the, the brick kiln motives that are a reference for the existing brick kilns around the corner. And so it faces two sort of sides to the park, and this is the longer side here, over two images onto the soccer pitch. And now we'll, we'll go back to the, the neighbour to Whitlam, um, which is newly completed apartments, which is for our repeat client milieu property. And we worked with them to comprise um, 14 individual apartments over five levels. And conceptually, the project vision here was a confluence of the site's civic qualities, the landscape pocket parks that we were discussing with the Whitland Place Park to the south, and finer grain domestic qualities of smaller scale structures, being the terrace dwellings and some great mid century walk up flats in the area. The design vision was to produce diversity of spaces that imbue an expression of both civic quality but articulated through human scale domestic construction and details and about how do you balance between solidity and lighter steel fenestration, which are reminiscent of some of these um, nearby 19th to century to early 20th century factory buildings. The proposed uh, Napier Street elevation here where the exterior of Napier next to Whitlam um, modulates transparency and solidity between the streetscape and interior experience within. Here it's emerging from Whitman Place to the left of the image, modulating that condition of interior privacy and, and thermal performance in a flexible and, and in a dynamic way, where our interpretation of local references draws on a collective of memory of, of forms and materials laid through subtle shifts 
the formal play articulated with softer planting, timber, steel, brick and concrete that extend from exterior to those interiors. At street level, the main lobby entry to the ground floor apartments are imbued with a bit more of a finer grain detail, articulated in Australian timbers, brick, brass and steel, and it feels far more filigree than, than Whitlam and more open, some layering of the detailing. And as a counterpoint to the solidity of Whitlam Place and Apey Street, it is more open-ended, as I said, and it's, um, it's really dealing with its own site um, and physical constraints. Moving componentry and exploration of modulating planes was the articulated response to the spatial challenges presented to us. Or at the place that had the public park adjacency, and with that we felt the appropriate site response was a, a stronger sense of uh, solidity and, and greater setback. With the Napier Street apartments, there was there were only two street frontages really, the rear lane and, and Napier Street on this side. And so a more open, transparent building that filters light and view you know, how you deal with privacy through a series of these moving or static planes um, was the what we felt was the appropriate design response. This cross section showing this where the open air common corridor from that front brick mail uh, mailbox you saw before extends through to a central courtyard, effectively dividing the project into two buildings. Brass is the recurring accent used to invoke a sense of occasion and enlivens that front gate mailboxes and private mail collection area. <clears throat> and there are two one bed apartments at ground level shown to the right of the image. There was shared purpose with the client to design flexible homes that comfortably accommodate a variety of household makeups within a diversity of dwelling types and common areas that engender a sense of community and social diversity. So these one bedders are part of five different dwelling types in a relatively small complex. The one bedders benefit from ground floor and internal planning that allows for work live opportunities. They, they enjoy natural light and cross flow ventilation from three different aspects. So the Napier, the central courtyard side and the common corridor side being the third. These private door, um, sorry, pivot doors divide the living and bedroom spaces and offer privacy and subtle reflections that accentuate the interior spaces. Um, the large pivot doors are an example of the many details that feel more, I guess, architectural than what is typical or is perhaps expected in many apartment interiors. Um, something similar might be found in an architect's own home, you might say, or and admittedly, they're, they're very sort of large and, and a bit cumbersome to use, but it becomes a bit of a performance in operating them. But we, we see that not as a negative, but um, such components or a sense of joinery elements can be a delightful experience to use and um, makes residents, I guess, take notice and become aware of the physicality of their home and, and become intimate with its many working parts. There's a, a kind of ancillary rear space to the main bedroom um, facing the internal courtyard, um, which has an abundance of storage, large enough to be a study or studio or capacious additional walk-in robe. Uh, Timothy, one of the residents, has made this space as an art studio and enjoys natural light and ventilation from that central courtyard seen beyond. The plan uh, shows the entry level to the double storey apartments to the left of the plan and to the right of the traditional two bed apartments. There's this unfolding sense of arrival takes cues from earlier modernist living with each apartment enjoying dual aspect cross flow ventilation through a series of these open air pathways. And the front door of each apartment combines an opal glass uh, and each sashless type window behind those timber battens. Um, brass um, highlights in the handles and uh, scutcheons, and evoking a subtle sense of grandeur for the entrance and setting a tone for the narrative within. And joinery highlights of brass extend the common area material finishes to the interior experience of each home. And joinery feels more like floating furniture pieces. There's always a desire um, to, to, I guess, balance and offset conditions of whether it be solidity with transparency and lightness or smooth against texture. And so for us, 
the functional or practical use of joinery within the department projects is very important and, and should not be compromised for aesthetics. Um, but so an example here in this side pantry unit in, in one of the two bed apartments doubles as a, a display shelf or a welcome station to one half. When sliding the door from the other half across, there's the utilitarian pantry shelving revealed behind. And there'll always be the need to rest that kitchen utensil or spices or herb pot. And so the, the open shelf capping the splashback is the recurring detail that we enjoy kind of detailing when we get into interiors. And here the use of brass um, to finish the shelf elevates the prosaic qualities of that shelf. And similar in Whitland Place, there was the Carrara marble splashback and those sort of Scarpa-esque flourishes that add moments and um, delight where rituals, daily rituals are elevated to be a joyful experience. So here flashing to a sort of modest extension to a, a home in Fitzroy North, again through these residential projects we explore similar details or intent where taking the brickwork on the boundary wall and rotating to protrude and provide shelving opportunities start to see fold back into our apartment projects in different ways. And even though an apartment building we believe the domestic scale construction and those methodologies or joinery details worked up through those singular home projects can find their way into larger projects to make them feel. A bit more um, care has been taken with the design and, and this is a recent photograph with um, one couple's apartment in Napier Street where we returned to take some photos for um, an Institute Awards press and we we're delighted to see how the, there's a real sense of ownership over the space and there was complementary um, details made to the interior um, sensibilities and overall sensibilities of the building's vision. They had lime washed the walls on the, behind there on the painting, sealed it with a wax finish, added a beautiful subtle depth and reflectivity to the wall. This contribution from the resident individualising their own space, um, but in keeping with that design intents, heightens those qualities of the contrasting textures mentioned earlier. The curved wall at the entry to the building is echoed here, where the spatial compression and expansion from the dining to living spaces is mediated through another curved and textured wall. And at first of all, it's quite lovely how apartments here at this level enjoy relationship with the residential street below yet still feel elevated and a sense of privacy being nestled in the street tree canopies. And there are these large sliding windows facing Napier Street that promote a flexible and dynamic relationship with the between the private dwellings and that public realm beyond. Again part of the experience of this building is the moving component of street and those sort of joinery elements and these doors can slide open to form Juliet balconies in the living spaces and conversely enclose the balcony to the left of this image making them internalised winter gardens at the same time. In Melbourne's changing weather patterns these large panels give the residents control over um, having a real sense of openness and, and light and breezy or closing them off if the weather were to change. Being on the east side of the building is sort of ideal, not a lot of prevailing winds from that side in Melbourne. In the bedrooms, the hit and miss screens below eye heights allow privacy without losing expansive views of Fitzroy beyond. This image, we see all those large sliding windows closed and here with them open with a few of the residents in frame. Where um, the deep plate shrouds become ledges that are safely, you can lean out onto and um, extend those interiors out into the street below. And I guess we started to um, look at a bit of that componentry in earlier projects. We saw those larger sliding windows starting um, at Hoddle Street, uh, the Hoddle House project, where at that important kind of interface to outside the threshold between those zones, um, where we're allowing those sliding doors to consolidate living spaces or divide them off in this, in this house became a device that um, allowed for multifunctional space to take place or extend the dining room out into that ancillary space. And also with an earlier project, a small infill project, 
where the, the glazing, that threshold to the, the deck and courtyard there became multifunctional through the surgery of the window and still, still doors opening up. There's a strong interest in the light quality through those windows as well, um, and also the way in which they frame views and giving newer meaning and a way, awareness of the textures at play as well as the light cast over this um, textured wall. And in Hoddle, it was more about the modulating of the ceiling and, and window proportions at different heights that really elevated from just being a suburban infill project and starting to feel depth in the facade that punctures a brick solid exterior. And so this was a really cheap 50 cent concrete brick um, that we applied a sealant to and we're pleased with the velvety finish we ended up with. So back to Napier Street and using that same brick range um, on a commercial project. We this time worked with the trades, the brickies to rough saw cut the brick and, and expose the aggregate within. You get subtle swirling texture from the radial saw blade, and exposes those coppery green tones and dispersed about 50% of those bricks through the whole project to get a chalky finish. And then looking at ways in which we can take quite a prosaic roof plumbing challenge and, and, and make something of it. So, you know, looking back at earlier uh, chain downpipe details from other projects and how we can um, turn it here in the common courtyard into a rain garden for the plants to be nurtured and watered over time. The common staircase is open. Many residents are just using this rather than the lift, which is great to see the coppery uh, oxidised. Finished a nod to Whitlam Place next door. And the next series of is a double story, two bed apartments. So a bit more of the diversity of that top the typologies in this project. The front doors to these townhouses are separated by buffering of soft landscape and voids through the sky bridges. And these apartments do not have bedroom windows at these levels, but at the levels below and above, so that there are no clashes with the common air circulation. We'll take you through a few of slides through the double story apartments now. So start with the front door, looking through to back me at the end, this thermal chimney effect drawing crossflow ventilation from the lower bedroom spaces up to this level and beyond through those ventilated doors. More sense of the occupation after the occupants have moved in. An integrated planter boxes as well were supplied to all the balconies, um, supported by hit and miss brick screens became these compositional delights, um, allowing for the planting to grow and envelop over time. And this resident has actually um, trained more of their plants up the cables that they've installed themselves and the chain down pipes bridging the balconies. So we'll take you to the top two floors of the building, which comprise two single level, three bedroom apartments facing Napier, Napier Street. And there's more three double storey apartments at the rear of the building. This is looking at those top level apartment entries at the top of the common area staircase. And this is the interior view of one of the single level, three bedroom apartments. Um, we always try and have a quality in the selection of finishes and a similar level of typical details across all the apartments, regardless of their size. You can see here the dining space is positioned next to the large sliding window to face Napier Street. With the window open, this space enjoys a direct connection with its immediate tree-lined street below and the landmark views of Fitzroy beyond. This larger three-bedder apartment was a result of one of the purchases consolidating two of the two-bedroom apartments into one larger home. We had designed these apartments with the knowledge that there may be a potential for the apartments to be consolidated. This meant that the design of the main street facade needed to be flexible enough to absorb such changes of the interior spaces. 
the modulation of the facade through the hidden mist brick screen and the light lighter steel rod balustrade all encompassed within a deep steel shroud help to frame the internal floor plan changes and we hope doesn't compromise the facade or lose the sense of it appearing meaningful and purposeful. This is the extension of the central balcony. That steel balustrade transition to the hidden mist screen to the lower proportion of the bedroom window, allowing ventilation and privacy to the lower portion and a clear view above. Compositionally floating joinery elements and finishes come together in a way that feel unmistakably Australian through their colour and tonal qualities. Our attitude towards selections of exterior and interior finishes within budget was simple lux that involved pairing economical finishes with a more high spec finish such as raw brass. And to finish off, um, I said at the start when we were trying to bookend you know, where we started with the North Melbourne townhouses and where we're up to now in our, in our projects and we're working on the largest um, project we've ever worked on um, and this is in Docklands, um, so not far from the CBD and the brownfield site on the edge of that city and you can see to the south, the south of the image there, the um, Victoria Harbour, so there's five buildings to be built in this precinct where the first cap of the rank. This is a mixed-use podium in mid-rise tower topology. It two sits adjacent a public park as one of its interfaces to the south. Again, working with open work to the landscape. We'll be discussing this park interface to the south first. You can see there's this residential street we've been working on adjacent to the public park. This interface off offered opportunities for our studio to explore varying degrees of engagement with the park and urban edge. The, the development plan for the local precinct resulted in a narrow footpath. And our design response to this narrowness was to implement a widening at the front of each stoop entry and include a bench seat. It was a bit of an offering, allowing either residents or public to take pause and the project provides similar moments of generosity and design elements and human scale to all four ground floor interfaces of the project. Again, each interface dealing with its um, specific context. The, the setback from the ground, from the boundary and the raised floor level of these ground floor living spaces pr protects the residents' privacy and allows them to have a greater control over the level of interaction with the park in individuality through landscaping elements is articulated through these bespoke bench seats to each townhouse and gives each dwelling a greater sense of identity. Um, a little sketch that's been worked up, I, I wish by us, but, but by a um, great illustrator for um, a marketing tool at the moment where it was just helping to describe the, um, the diversity of types on this um, park edge where at lower level there's a, a double story apartment with that um, meandering stoop entry sequence we're describing the next level in the middle is a single uh, level one bed apartments and then followed by double story apartment above that one and then capped out with these large um, terrace apartments that are multi that are tiered so a single large terrace apartment at this level and then a tiered version above it before the tower starts and um, there's, there's dual access to the, the rear to the car park and the, these become the, the line or edge condition to, to screen the car park in the middle of the podium. And just some white card models looking at those stoops and those wing walls expressed as large kind of legs to the podium as they come down and become a garden wall to, to greet you. And this being the main kind of commercial strip side of uh, the northern side of the building we start to see the tower and some um, reminiscent articulation from Whitman Place. And, and the corner is a glass block commercial space of five levels where we have um, 
been exploring this idea on the corner as it's the first building to the precinct, the first that you will see that it's this kind of gateway building and an illuminated um, lantern kind of prosaic idea, but that it becomes illuminated at night and becomes the kind of street lamp as you come to this kind of cul-de-sac condition of, of apartment buildings. And it's the entry lobby at the ground there as well. So we've been you know, looking at recent, recent projects like this smaller domestic project we're working on in Princess Hill where the translucent um, sandblasted glass really becomes a bit of an influence on these larger projects and the beautiful ethereal light quality that we're, we'd be hoping to replicate in the entry lobby working with our photographer, we use regularly with Gavin Green to look at material and light studies at the beginning of um, the design of that facade for the Docklands project and, and the properties and colour quality of light and, and that's been a great process as well, starting to collaborate with different artists. Finishing here with the south view from the park back towards the podium and the tower above. And that finishes our presentation. Thank you, Adam. That was awesome, guys. It was really great. I'm just going to um, get myself into order. You caught me by surprise slightly. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and that's all right. Uh, that was really beautiful. There's a couple of questions coming through about one of them um, Sandy wanted to ask was who are your kind of heroes, architectural heroes, or who do you kind of channel? So, you know, not to put you on the spot or anything, but um, <laughs> there's some, I mean, there's some, uh, there's some obvious references, I think, in some of your work, but is there, is there somebody who you look at and you think, oh my gosh, we just adore what they do? I think they've probably finished their work now. It's sort of looking back more at the seminal Australian architects that we constantly refer back to, the grounds, the, the guns and the um, gun gun and... Robin Boyd, we, we sort of find that there's a lot to be learnt from, from previous projects. And I guess, you know, more contemporaries, it, it would be sort of the Al Alvaro Caesars and, the, um, and, and locally, you know, Kirsten Thompson's work in, in the housing projects, the amazing kind of, as you were saying, Adam, flexible arrangements in those multi res projects is something we, we kind of look to on closer, closer projects to home. Mm. Bit of, there's a bit of Nonda reference there too, I think, suspect. Yes, <laughs> the early Nonda, the we forgot that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that. We, uh, we did reach out to Nonda about um, the copper. So initially we were looking at putting the copper filings in our concrete for Whitland Place and um, deterred not to just because of the way, you know, he experienced how it could uh, corrode the, the pipework or some of the services of the building or the rear and the concrete. So there's yeah, yeah there's definitely some lessons learned from the master there. Yeah, nice. And there's, um, uh, Scott had a question just wanting to know about the windows at um, Whitland Place on the, particularly on the, the penthouse level, the, the way that they kind of go up past the ceiling to give you that thin edge on the top level. Was that, was that a uh, design from the start approach or was that something you kind of developed throughout the process? No, that ha that's designed from the start for sure because it has to be engineered. So basically you hold the roof structure back and you've got these steel outriggers that hold the windows and the parapet capping. So it definitely has to be from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's a great way to kind of get that sense of it floating. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I think the other one, Robert, uh, Robert wanted to know about the, the rainwater overflow on Whitlam Place, which I suspect is a subtle reference to Corb, but is it or is it <laughs> not so place? subtle? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a few nods there and, and I saw Brower's Whitney Museum with the windows and um, yeah, they're, they're little, they're over, over embellished balcony pops um, for overflow <laughs> I haven't seen one gush with water yet. Gorgeous, really beautiful. Um, well, thank you both. We really appreciate it. It was really great to have you on and I know that um, you juggle life, business, children, everything, which is one of the reasons you're so late in the process to coming to this because when I rang Alana, I, said, I want to have you on, and I was like, but I've just got to get the kids back at school first. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah, just uh, out of the chaos. So thank you for waiting, Adam. That was yeah. great. <laughs> no, thank you. Really appreciate having you on. Uh, it's been really great. And thank you to everybody who has been involved. Um, we've had a few internationals, uh, predominantly Australians. Uh, we were sending a sending a thank you to Joe Noero today at South Africa and found out that Australia Post is no longer posting to South Africa, which is quite interesting. There's wow. a whole lot of countries that there's no postal going to, so that's quite intriguing. Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting period for us. We've really enjoyed running these. Uh, thanks to all the architects that um, contributed. And also to you guys, uh, I like the fact, Michael, you, you mentioned Avera Caesar because we actually have an Avera Caesar book in the in the bookshop at the moment, which is the AMAG, the latest AMAG on Avera Caesar. So that is available <laughs> if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, the bookshop is closing within uh, the end of the month. We've got a couple of weeks to go. Uh, if you buy a book, Michael will be, if you live in Sydney at least, Michael, husband Mike, hand delivers. So say hello to him when he delivers it to you. Um, but again, uh, we, we have one more event that the bookshop is going to run, which is uh, now we have an empty shop. Um, we have the opportunity to use the shop for something else for a little bit of time. So we're having a project models exhibition, uh, which will open uh, in, a, in a week or so. Um, but we want to, and actually I think that date is incorrect, so sorry about that date. It's not the Saturday the 5th of June, it's opening in a couple of weeks. I'll put it up on the website. Um, but we do want to uh, you know, encourage people to contact us if they'd like to put a model into the bookshop. The intent is to have 20 to 30 models, to open it over weekend, to get the public in, to have a look, and just to kind of, I suppose, use the space for something else. Um, but again, thank you very much to everybody. We really enjoyed it. It's the last of our talks, and we'll see.